Welcome everybody to the American TESOL Institute's webinar series. My name is Jason Levine, also known as Fluent CMC. I'm excited today to be here to talk to you about a topic that, wow, has really generated a lot of discussion in social media since I introduced it uh, a week or so ago. Why aren't my students speaking English? I worded it a bit differently depending on where I was sharing it. This webinar is brought to you by the American TESOL Institute and Prep It Fluency. I'm glad I shared it in social media because I got so many responses that have helped me put together uh, what we're going to talk about tonight. Tonight for me, I'm in Paris, France. We have people here live all over the world. If you're here live, thanks so much for joining us. If you're watching this after the fact, asynchronously, thank you so much. And of course, we love your support sharing these uh, recordings out to friends and colleagues. As I said, Prep and Fluency and a American TESOL Institute are who we thank today for making this webinar possible. American TESOL Institute is also proud to present featured teachers. This is another webinar we hold once a month. We have one with Gustavo, Gustavo Gonzalez from uh, Argentina coming up Wednesday, August 5th. After this featured teachers, we will have an Ask the Expert sessions. Here you see a picture of Jennifer. Uh, we will have Gustavo uh, with us a week or so after the featured teacher session to do a small group session where cameras, microphones are on and it's interactive from start to finish. If that's something that interests you, join the featured teachers Facebook group that's the best place to find out information about features teachers and ask the experts. Innovative Teachers of English. If you're not in this group, this is the most active uh, group of English language teachers and students are also welcome on Facebook in the world. So it's a wonderful resource. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's get started. We're going to talk about why aren't your students speaking English or enough English or that much English? Or as I said, I phrased it a bit differently when I put this question out there into the ether, into the ELT ether. And I came up with the top 12 reasons. Now, this is not uh, scientific research <laughs> by any means. In the last two weeks, gathering ideas from uh, Facebook groups, from colleagues, from people in different places, especially in social media. We will begin with number 12. <laughs> they need to be doing more pair and group work. Now, I think it's rather unusual today, at least I hope, to find a communicative language classroom where there isn't pair and group work. However, emphasis here on more pair and group work and what they're doing in parent group work, which we're going to be getting to. If you are one of those teachers that says, well, <clears throat> when I put them in pairs and groups, then they're speaking their first language, they're not on task, I can't manage. There are many wonderful ways to do parent group work that perhaps you're not doing. I put this as number 12, but you'll see how this one and others uh, definitely overlap. It's also about how you do it and doing it so that the students really enjoy being in groups and will be speaking more and more as a result. Moving along to number 11. You're pressuring them, be patient, allow for a silent period. There are a few things packed in here and let me just say, because I, I don't think I did and I should have, but luckily it's still early in the list. Uh, the reason that these are number 12, number 11, down to number one, when there were so many uh, comments, uh, and, and some, many of which are not in this, on this list, it's because so many people uh, you know, said something exactly like this or similar to this. I see uh, in my travels around to English classrooms and my experience as a teacher trainer, teachers who have the best intentions, good hearts, they, they don't realize it, but because they're so uh, passionate, let's say, <laughs> about getting their students to speak, they're being a little pushy. 
And, you know, you have to speak English. If you don't speak English, how are you going to learn English? You know, productive skills, speaking, this really depends so much on receptive skills, what you've taken in and when you've taken it in. Is it at a level where you can absorb it, acquire it? The important thing here is to understand, if you don't already, <clears throat> that if students, if there's evidence that they're interested, this is important, if there's evidence that they're learning, right, whether it's, you know, uh, knowing the answer to something, be able to being able to read uh, in English, understand when they listen, but they're not speaking. If there's evidence that they're learning, measuring their level or how good they are by what they're producing in their speaking, not such a good idea, especially if there's any pressure involved. So it does take time. That's the idea of patience here. And don't forget, when you learn the first language, there's this silent period where you're getting your the input comes in, you're processing it. When it's time, when you're ready, that's when you're going to produce it. Number 10, the language and or activities are too difficult. Or maybe it's not just that they're too difficult. Of course, that could be a problem. But it could be that they're more on the level of helping your students at their level of comprehension, but not at their level of production. So we just talked about the idea of receptive skills and productive skills. So for example, if they're reading something that is at or above their level of reading, and they need to think, okay, uh, what does this word mean? I, I can't really figure out this sentence structure. Right? Using their energies for that, it's not a bad thing, but that's certainly not going to be something that gets them speaking. It's not just about the difficulty level, but it's about what is going to really make them be ready to feel ready to speak. And that's maybe a different level than what they could actually figure out and understand. And the idea of, are they prepared enough with that target language? It might not be too difficult if they have more time with the language that they need to use to, to speak and produce. We're going to get to that. That's super important. That's coming. Your students don't feel sufficiently safe or valued. There were a lot of uh, different comments uh, that, that mentioned this in one way or the other, right? Also, the idea of are, are, do they feel cared for? You know, is the teacher interested enough in what they have to say? Um, certainly, if we're feeling stressed, uh, and that might relate to the pressure we mentioned earlier. Uh, if they don't feel safe in that sense, so I'm not talking about safety in terms of you know physical safety, but are they in an environment where they feel comfortable enough to start talking? And that can also, of course, have to do with how they feel around their peers. So it may be that the teacher is doing whatever she can or he can, uh, but their weight reasons that the student is not feeling comfortable because of things going on with their peers. So not an easy, easy thing to manage. So many different variables. This is uh, something that a teacher may not be aware of, uh, may be aware of, but not know how to handle. Uh, I strongly urge you to you know, talk to colleagues if you feel this might be the case. You know, what, what could I do to make uh, my students feel uh, better about being in class? Are there issues with peers? Are there cultural issues between you know, me and these students or other types of uh, personal issues? Uh, so that, that's a big one. Number eight. Ah, this is what I was referring to a bit earlier when I was saying uh, about if language is difficult. Could be difficult because it's simply difficult. <laughs> it's, it's too high level. It may be this, that the target language, what they need to do to produce uh, in the classroom orally, right? So if we take an example, making requests, right? And there's an activity, you know, to uh, ask for information, request for information. Could you tell me how to get to this? Or could you help me with this? That target language, those grammatical structures, the vocabulary, don't hide it, keep it out there. Um, if speaking practice is uh, too much this idea of just speak, just talk, and could be because you as a teacher 
uh, again, with the best intentions, thinking, okay, I want fluency over accuracy. I just want you to speak. Don't worry about mistakes. Something else we're going to get to. That's great. But it's not as simple as just speak, don't worry about mistakes. If the students haven't prepared enough, if they don't have the target language ready to go, an activity that could go really, really badly could also go really, really well with students talking a lot if they don't have to remember or check or look up you know, what to do, what to say. And that comes from what we see here, two things together, target language visible on the board, in front of them, uh, on cards, whatever, however it is on, on your screen. Uh, and then structured speaking practice, lots of examples of that information gaps, gap fill activities, you know, um, uh, dialogues where students do not have to create things because they're not at that point yet. Structure does not mean it's not meaningful. Structure does not mean it's uh, decontextualized. Structure does not mean boring. If it's not structured enough at the stage where it needs to be structured, you can't really expect students to speak. They need that scaffolding. They need that support. <laughs> it sounded like I was complaining a moment ago. If the idea is, well, it's just about fluency, don't worry if you make mistakes, that should be enough. Well, number seven is number seven because it's so important, but it goes along with other things that we're talking about here. A lot of, you know, heavy error correction, uh, measuring students, you know, use of grammar and vocabulary, and if they feel at all, uh, worried, ashamed, uh, reluctant to speak because of mistakes they might make, it's not going to work. Mistakes are so important to make because it's only through mistakes and the help you give the students, whether it's direct correction or they see the correct form in the game that they're playing, in the activity that they're doing, that's so important to build proficiency in English. However, we also need to have that target language there. We need to have structure to help them. It's not just about going out and speaking and making mistakes. Uh, we need to help them enough with the input. Ah, input. I believe that's coming up somewhere. Now here, for the first time, we're getting into uh, more specific suggestions for activities. So we begin at uh, the first one, number 12, I believe, was more pair, root, more pair work, more group work. So here are some examples of pair work and group work. Uh, and I put these three things here because I heard them so many times uh, this last uh, week or two uh, when I was out there in Facebook groups and other places asking this question. So debates came up a lot uh, and that's wonderful. Obviously we're not talking about the little, little ones probably for debates, uh, but certainly uh, as early as, you know, the beginning of middle school, and you could even do it earlier in primary school, just in a you know, sort of simplified version of the debate all the way up. Uh, students preparing to express their opinions. Personalized dialogues. So a structured activity with dialogues where students are not completely on their own is important, but then also more personalized dialogues as they're doing more free practice, where it's something that's not some you know, dull thing from the book that they're just uh, having to reproduce, but something that is more along the lines of, you know, what they would say, what they would do, or what they have done, what they have said um, can be great. So that came up a lot. And drama scenes, lots of variations on this, you know, a, a whole play, uh, creating your own uh, drama scene, uh, acting out a scene from uh, a TV series, um, whether it's something that you are has already been written and that falls more into the line of, of the practice and more structure or something they create on their own a lot of people made this suggestion so i put these three together for number six number five ah we're going to be here for a moment <laughs> you should provide more input in english now, this is interesting because you may look at this and think, wait a second, 
Does that mean teachers talking more? Well, think about what this means. For example, uh, what's included in here is, you know, using more English in the classroom, the teacher modeling more things for students, input from movies, from songs, from uh, poets, from storytellers, from conversations. So input does not just mean teacher talking. Why is this important? How does it relate to students not speaking? To me, it goes back to what we said a little bit earlier about needing uh, the target language there, needing to get repetition and have enough input. So it's not just input that, you know, uh, is always new, right? <laughs> sort of, it's not that, right? I would say it's input, but it's comprehensible input, right? Not too difficult. Things that they're going to want to naturally use when they speak without enough input that's understandable, that they've been exposed to enough times, that they have visible to them, as we said before, speaking, they're going to be reluctant for so many reasons, right? Translating too much, you know, having to try to remember what it was uh, that they heard or they read, right? Feeling like it's more uh, of a test, something they're anxious about. So this is huge. It does not mean you should talk more. It's not simple like that. <laughs> it means, right, getting more English that they understand and are interested in, uh, in there for them, and then creating activities, structuring things for them to help them start using all right, that vocabulary, start using those grammar structures, start using that functional English. Activities should, should be more task-based and student-centered. Many people said at the same time something about task-based learning, project-based learning, you know, uh, students creating things, uh, you know, motivated to, to do something that really appealed to them. If you have anything that is task-based or project-based and is not uh, doesn't take into account students' interests, <laughs> it's not student-centered, uh, it's, not, it's not going to work. Task-based learning, TBL, or project-based learning, PBL, and having it be uh, student-centered and, of course, pair and group work we talked about earlier, gives students uh, a lot of autonomy uh, and feeling more, there's more meaning in what they're doing. It's not just something that, you know, uh, comes comes from a textbook or is preparation for a test. It's something they can really do with English. To do this requires, here we go again, uh, enough uh, exposure and comfort with the target language so that it's it's easy to do. And when I say easy, it doesn't mean there shouldn't be a challenge in there, but that you know they're eager to to do this task that really focuses on on them and their group. Um, they're able to get right into it because they're already familiar enough with vocabulary and grammar structures that they need to do it. That doesn't mean they're not learning things along the way. Of course they are. But if you set them out on a task, and this happens, unfortunately, in a lot of classrooms I've visited, uh, but they're not really ready. They haven't prepared enough for it, doing things that are more controlled before they have a freer activity it doesn't work as well. There are many examples, by the way, of task-based learning and project-based learning that incorporate, you know, the best stuff incorporates that into it. Moving on. It's almost like we just talked about this one, but there are a few more things we need to say. So as important as it is to many teachers out there to do task-based learning, to, to get students engaged in more student-centered, not teacher-centered uh, projects where the teacher is facilitating, you know, monitoring, uh, helping it to be successful. Even more important than that is that these should be directly connected with students' interests. It might not have to be so uh, project-based if they just sort of take off running with it. It might not have to be designed in that way. I guess what I'm trying to say and what teachers are trying to say with this one is that uh, it's sort of, you know, where we begin, right? If we're looking at why there's not enough speaking going on, if you feel your students should be speaking more, if, if this isn't there, if they're not doing activities uh, that you've figured out they're really going to enjoy 
it's not just what uh, is in the textbook. It's not just what's on the syllabus in terms of the topics. Um, and let's stop and talk about that for a moment because you, you may be a teacher saying, well, yeah, but I can't really stray very far from the syllabus and these topics. It takes, a, it takes, it takes experience, <laughs> it takes patience uh, and some creativity. But if you have a topic that is presented in the book in a way or in other materials that you, you, you need to use, that you have no choice but to use, um, you can find other things from really knowing your students, you know, who they are, how old they are, where they live, what they like to do. Um, once you've figured that out, you can at different points along the way kind of bend things, uh, whether it's bending the topic a little closer to, to their interests or, or uh, bending the language a little bit more towards their uh, interests. So it could be, you know, uh, some, some expressions that are more actually, this is another one that almost made the list here, you know, kind of slang expressions or expressions that are not, you know, things that are not in the book that could also be uh, connect to a topic or connect to an activity or images or, or short videos that are not uh, in the curriculum, but that connect to whatever the topic is that you can uh, bring in. And that, and that goes for, you know, pronunciation, for, for grammar also. So it could be, uh, there's so many great YouTube videos now, uh, people teaching pronunciation, people teaching grammar, that even, you know, bringing something in on a topic that is uh, maybe a little bit dry in the materials you have, um, you're connecting with their interests in that way. That you, you know them and you know that, if they uh, look at this language or hear this language in this song or uh, in, in this video, in this cartoon, um, they're going to be more connected. That's what you do and keep doing. So that's number three. Number two and number one. Would anyone like to guess? You've seen what, let's go, let's, let's go back actually, right? Let's go back and review because we're getting down to our top two. And let's get the chat open here. The top 12 reasons why your students aren't speaking English. Number 12, they need to be doing more pair and group work. Number 11, you're pressuring them, be patient. Allow for a silent period or maybe multiple silent periods as you go along. Evidence of their learning is what we're looking for more than measuring how much they're speaking. Number 10, the language uh, or the activities are too difficult, too difficult because of the level or maybe too difficult because you haven't given them enough exposure or time with the materials. Are you thinking about what number two and number one are? Put it in the chat if you think you know, something you haven't heard yet. Number nine, your students don't feel sufficiently safe or valued. We said that could be uh, something you're doing and not realizing. Uh, it could be pressure they're feeling from you, from other students, a cultural issue that's getting in the way. Where is the target language? Is it buried somewhere? <laughs> is it something that you expect that they can just remember and they've got it ready to go? It may seem like that, but very often this is a huge problem. We're trying to get students to do something very cool with language to give them more free practice, they're not doing it because they're not ready. Oh, we got a guess here, too much TTT. <laughs> I want you to guess what you think number two and number one are, if you're here live with me right now. So number seven, maybe you're focusing too much on accuracy. Maybe you're making them feel strange about making a mistake. Maybe their peers are. Maybe focusing on fluency uh, is a great thing to do, but if they haven't had enough exposure to the language, they haven't had enough practice with the language, it doesn't matter if they're feeling okay about mistakes because they're just not speaking yet. Number six, more debates, personalized dialogues, drama scenes. I saw so many comments about debates, dialogues, and drama scenes that they collectively became number six. Number five, Perhaps they're not getting enough input in English. This may be because you're not using enough English in class. You're not bringing in enough English. 
in the classroom. Number four, activity should be more task-based and student-centered. Number three, they should be doing activities that directly connect with their interests. So what do you think? Number two and number one. <laughs> they should be playing more games. This is not included in the other one about dialogues, uh, debates, and drama for the simple reason that it was the most common response with the exception of number one. This is uh, something that so many teachers have had success with getting their students talking. So we can talk about how games can do a lot of things uh, to, to help the atmosphere in a classroom to help relationships in the classroom, uh, just getting students more interested, motivated, excited, but speaking more. How do games get students speaking more? And I've seen uh, classrooms where the, there is first language speaking going on in the game, but uh, sort of you know negotiating things and certain things, it's just more natural to use the first language. However, the students are using speaking more because the game requires the speaking. So it's, you know, I just want to play the game and to play the game I'm speaking. Uh, so huge, right? It's the learning when you're not looking, or in this case, you know, speaking when you're not looking in the sense that, you know, speaking the second language without stopping to think, oh, am I making mistakes or, uh, why am I doing this, right? There is a purpose. A game is, you know, a ta is task-based, you know. This is the task. We're playing the game. Uh, and as far as students' interests, you know your students, you know their needs and, and, and what they like to do. You, you're the best person to figure out what game it is. And it can be a game to help them with grammar, with pronunciation. It can be a game where they don't think about grammar or pronunciation at all, but as a result of needing English for the game, again, having that target language there, and if it's in the cards they're playing with, if it's on the board they're playing with, if it's in the, the computer game they're playing with, if you've got that target language there, those structures, those vocabulary words. The other thing about games, everybody, is repetition. If you like the game, you play it again. And in the end, repetition uh, with vocabulary and grammar structures, that's going to be the best way to get it in the students' heads. And if it's in the students' heads and they're comfortable with it, they're going to be ready to produce it. I started out making games and then making songs for the same reasons, uh, but games as opposed to songs. And why I think music, it was mentioned, but music was not mentioned uh, so often, is because music is more of the, you know, getting it into your head on your own. It can help you speak more in class, but games are interactive. And you're really getting much more, uh, you're getting the, the, the English through the games, the repetition, but you're also getting the opportunity to, to speak during the game and to use English during the game. So uh, to me, not surprising at all that this was uh, up near the top. So number one, someone here live guessed it. They guessed it in the chat. Here it is. <laughs> Too much TTT. Reduce your teacher talking time. First thing to say about this is let's not confuse teacher talking time with teacher's input uh, in English or bringing in input in English when it's input that will lead to speaking. What we're talking about here, and I have a, a couple quotes uh, I wrote down. Um, so there were, of course, for this to be number one, so many people, so many teachers in the Innovative Teachers of English group and other places I posted this, uh, this was the first thing they said uh, when I put out that question, why aren't my students speaking English? It is the amount of TTT, so reducing it, like if there's too much, but it's also the type of TTT. So let me, let me explain, I think two quotes here illustrate this well. Someone said, stop presenting and give them activities that make them talk. The presentation does not have to be only you presenting, right? It can be bringing in, again, back to bringing in English input, doesn't have to just be you talking. And then how long are you gonna do it for? How long are you gonna keep presenting? Um, 
will they be, uh, are, are, are you gonna use your time in your lesson planning more on the presentation or on thinking of what activities are really gonna get them ready to speak? So that's what this person meant here. And another thing I wrote down, stop talking about yourself and get them to speak about themselves. I think uh, the person that wrote that got like 14 likes <laughs> that comment, right? So that also goes back to the idea of, you know, what's interesting for them. What you're saying about yourself may or may not be interesting to them. Uh, so stop talking about yourself, get them to talk about themselves. And that's back to, you know, students doing uh, activities that are more uh, based on on them, you know, personalized dialogues we mentioned, uh, student-centered uh, tasks, uh, things that are really about them, um, and you've you've put in that work to figure out that about them. That's so important. The interesting thing here is comparing teacher talking time with input in English. So certainly, if your TTT is in the first language and you're sort of going on and on that's something that you need to consider but then also in english if you're just presenting too much because that's really what this is about i think more than anything uh and not giving them the opportunities in small groups pairs groups getting them speaking getting them into it um it's not it's not going to work they, they won't speak but then again if they're not getting enough input in english how are they going to how can there be output so if you're thinking, okay, I'm not going to talk so much. I'm just going to kind of encourage them to speak, you know, go on, speak English, speak English, you know, don't worry if you make mistakes. If there's not enough input, if there's not enough exposure to the target language, then whatever activity you give them, uh, they'll be too bored, stressed, disconnected uh, because they won't have enough exposure. They won't have enough input to then uh, turn into output. So those uh, structured speaking activities, the presentation of uh, having a lot of exposure to the language they need for, for the activity, that's so important. So we have the TTT versus input question and we have the fluency versus accuracy question. So the answer I think is both. It depends. It depends where you are with them, where they are with you and with the language. Certainly, fluency first, if we're talking about the idea of right, not monitoring and worrying too much about your mistakes, if that's holding them back. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, mistakes that are there because they don't have enough input are not the same kind of mistakes, right? So they want to have... Uh, enough support with the language so that, of course, they're going to make mistakes. And those mistakes, we can help them with much more easily because they're more fluent using uh, the language that we are giving them to use. So it's making that language available uh, so they can see it. They've repeated it. They've done enough structured practice with it so they can be more fluent uh, not worry about mistakes and then error correction. That's another topic, <laughs> but then that you use error correction in a way that keeps them motivated, that helps them get the correct forms in their head because accuracy is a major, major part of fluency, which I will get to shortly. Looking at the top 12, I noticed right, number three and number four certainly go hand in hand, right? Uh, students' interests connected to the task-based or project-based learning that is student-centered, right? Those, to me, go, go together, uh, completely go together, right? So uh, those were number three and number four. And then we had these three we talked about in this webinar, which are more about the specific activities themselves. Well, they need to be doing more pair and group work uh, goes back to... Uh, how they'll succeed more in speaking more in, in, in a task that is student-centered. And just back to the input in English idea, right? That was number five. If we look at number 11, number eight, and number 10, I hope you can see the connections here. So if you're providing more input, again, doesn't mean just your voice, right? It can mean input, uh, things that videos you bring in, 
uh, songs you bring in, uh, short, short things from the media, whatever it is, and it doesn't have to be just spoken input, whatever it is, um, there's a period where right, they're going to be soaking that up. And if you, we need to be patient. So it's, even if you feel like, oh, I want them to speak, I want them to speak, remember that it is not natural to just <laughs> speak. The, that language needs to be up here and comfortable with it uh, for it to come out. They, they may understand something, but not be ready to produce it, especially uh, in an original uh, way, in an original sentence that they create. And again, it's not just about the input and then expecting them to remember it, make, keep it there. Let them, you know, go back to it, make it visible. Uh, have them uh, do meaningful repetition with it in a structured way before they're doing the debate, before they are uh, making a presentation. And is it too difficult? And I mentioned earlier, difficult could mean that it's, for example, if it's a reading input, that they they can get it but it requires a lot of stopping looking up translating it's sort of under the microscope that's not reading for fluency that's not reading for speaking that's good for reading comprehension skills and we can say the same for listening so it may be that what they're doing requires them to think a lot about what they're doing and use you know higher order thinking which is great we want our students to do that, but not good if uh, they're doing that before they're comfortable enough with the language, um, especially if you want to get them speaking. So I just want to take the last few minutes here to, to tell you uh, what I do when I'm talking to teachers about this topic, which is to first really understand the difference between studying English or learning about the language. I mentioned under the microscope, you know, what does that word mean? And what does uh, this grammar mean? And this pronunciation, you know, how do I move my mouth? And those are great things, but those are not the same uh, at all as practicing or using English. So it's important to, to understand how the language works and to study certain things, but then, if we think from there, we're going to just speak English. So I have using English here, but right now we're talking about speaking. So am I going to just, you know, figure this stuff out with the help of my teacher and then be able to speak freely in the classroom during an activity? No, it's not going to work. So what's missing is the practice. So I said we're going to get to a point here where I'm going to get on my soapbox and talk about practicing English, uh, the whole idea of meaningful repetition as a way to get comfortable and have the target language ready to use, that to jump from studying to using won't work. So a good way to look at this is with a very simplified uh, image of Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive uh, teaching objectives, educational objectives. So this is uh, super simplified uh, for what I want to talk about with you now. Uh, as I said, the whole point of getting students to apply, speak what they have learned, to get into higher order thinking and, you know, get into uh, task-based task and prop, uh, 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 project-based learning where they're using their brains in this way. This is, you know, amazing. This, we should do this. But, but <laughs> if we push them uh, or kind of put them in an activity where they have, when they're not uh, at a point where the grammar and the vocabulary uh, is natural to them, easy to access. In other words, they haven't, had enough exposure to it. They haven't seen that collocation enough times to really have it ready to go, right? They haven't uh, played with that grammar structure enough to have it ready to go. So in the old days, it was about, you know, rote learning and memorization, uh, which I do not, of course, advocate. But don't make the mistake, please, of thinking that without enough repetition, without enough exposure, without enough practice, students will be able to use English in the ways that we want them to uh, ultimately use English and speak English. Games, 
which was number two on the list, right? I think, you know, besides the fact that students are communicating in a fun and natural way when they play a game, they're also, with good games, getting a lot of repetition. Uh, drama, which is another one, you know, repeating scenes, whether they're scenes in drama that they, that someone else did that they're repeating or ones they've written themselves and you've helped them correct, that repetition is going to get those grammar structures, those vocabulary words, those collocations in their heads. That's the remembering, that's the base. That memory, remembering and understanding leads to using English, being able to produce it. So it's receptive to productive, uh, but it's not as simple as receptive productive. It's not as simple as it needs to be uh, comprehensible. It's also about the repetition, the exposure. We need that base. We need that foundation. As my colleague Chuck Sandy once said, practice builds accuracy. Accuracy builds confidence. Confidence builds fluency. This is my mantra. I always say, I wish I'd said it first, but when he said it, it immediately connected to what I do and what I believe so strongly in. So the idea here being that practice, whether it's through repetition in games, songs, short videos, drama, whatever it is, uh, that that means the student will more likely be accurate in their use of grammar, their pronunciation, uh, they'll be able to understand more accurately. It's not just about accuracy in production. And what happens? That missing piece, right, <laughs> for fluency, that confidence, that is not just confidence, but that interest in what they're doing can come out because they're not as worried about whether they're correct or not. So I don't mean perfect English. Accuracy does not mean perfect. It means that, right, you, you're able to get your message across and understand the message more accurately. You feel better, you feel more confident, and then that's when fluency comes in. And that's why I was, you know, when, when teachers mentioned, hey, tell, don't worry about accuracy, fluency, fluency, fluency. Um, you know, don't worry about mistakes. I agree, but they need the practice to get there. And if you think, well, I, I don't know why they're not speaking because I'm all for fluency. I, I'm not worried about mistakes. If they don't have the language ready to go, right? Of course, it's not going to be perfect. We want more mistakes, but we want the mistakes, right? To be <laughs> going uh, up in the sense that they're making mistakes with uh, more and more vocabulary and grammar because they're getting more of it. They're interested in it. They're connecting with it. And that's when the fluency can happen and accuracy is uh, helping to to push uh, the fluency forward. If you're here live, tell me, practice makes what? It's a trick question. Oh, I like these answers. Now, I love practice makes perfect. If, if, when we say perfect, we mean what I just was talking about. So let's let's just go back to there. Practice builds accuracy. If we're talking about that's what perfect means, in a way the student's confident and it's fun, it feels good. If you're trying to get that TikTok dance to be perfect, if you're trying to get that uh, guitar chord to sound perfect, uh, if you're trying to uh, get your uh, whatever game you're, you're playing, whether it's sports or some game, you want to be perfect at it and you're motivated, then perfect is fine. The problem with perfect, of course, is feeling like, oh, I'm still making mistakes. Now, that's why practice makes perfect is not as good as, in my opinion, practice makes progress. It's all about progress, whether it's speaking progress, whether it's progress in your relationships with your students and your students' relationships with one another. Um, it's all about progress, right? Thanks so much, everybody, for being here today. Let me stop for a moment and say hello to you who are here live. Wow, so great to have so many people here live uh, today. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. See you soon. See you next time.